um, where because they built this um, super highway, the, the village, which used to exist more or less on the sides of the valley, um, we had to now, they knocked down all the footbridges, we had to now um, basically go under the bridge, over the river, and then up the slope on the other side. And they, they literally knocked down about 100 um, of these footbridges. So that was the program. We began to look into it. We developed um, a series of small bridges for these different sites. And what we wanted to do was, even in a very limited project, to try to implement a small piece of uh, public space um, into the bridge itself. This, uh, this is one um, which has been recently built uh, maybe a, a year and a half ago. We're interested in space, so spatially it's a, you know, it's, it, it's a bridge that uh, wraps around itself. Uh, the original idea was uh, a kind of structural wall, so it could, like the, by wrapping itself underneath, it would help support it. It didn't turn out to be uh, necessary, and as all unnecessary things in the rural are um, eliminated right away. It's a very, very interesting site to work in. But basically, this is underneath the, uh, the high-speed um, rail line. You see the, the big footing above. And uh, part of the bridge connects the farmland. They can bring their, their small motorized vehicles. And then the other part of the bridge connects down to the river where uh, the women have uh, usually do their washing. So small micro public space, even within infrastructure. This is another project which shows how we uh, began to um, also re react to large-scale infrastructure. Uh, this is the high-speed railway um, being built. And um, over here on the right is a small courtyard school. Um, we had to expand it. We basically did another courtyard school and then had these two courtyards. And then, um, because they had built this um, high-speed rail, this, this uh, small hill right behind it had become um, destabilized, and they had to build a retaining wall. So ultimately, what we did was we tried to build in um, a toilet with a kind of toilet infrastructure for um, reed bed into this uh, retaining wall. So what you see is a toilet. Uh, a new playground, and then uh, from the toilet, this kind of reed bed cleansing system, trying to take advantage of all the little pieces to kill two or three birds with one stone. I think that's the quality which architects are very good at. Um, this is the first building. Uh, a lot of frustration over spending the uh, expensive tile material on the inside of the building instead of the outside of the building. But I, I, I find that the the the, the raw brick <coughs> makes a better dialogue <coughs> excuse me, with uh, what's around it. We found this, this beautiful um, uh, reflective tile that we, we used. And uh, this is the classroom. I'm going to kind of speed up here because not only are you getting tired, I'm getting tired also. Um, and, and it creates this kind of wonderful effect on, on the stairs, um, the, the toilet as well, you know, because it's important to have mirrored surfaces. You can really, you can really see yourself everywhere in this toilet, um, and, and you can see others, I guess, <laughs> as well, in case anyone's spying on you. Um, working on the back of this slope. Um, the last pair I want to show you is uh, the issue of adaptation versus mutation. Uh, at taking this kind of um, clue from evolution, architecture which uh, adapts. This is the first project, uh, a 300-year-old bridge in um, Guizhou, also done with students. They uh, we worked with the Wuzhou Chao Foundation, which builds bridges around China. And the idea was to fix this broken arch in this historic bridge. Um, after we did this, we submitted this to um, UNESCO, 
and uh, they, they expressed strong reservations about the insertion of new materials and applications of designs not fully in keeping with the bridge's character. And this really, I think, was an eye-opener um, in terms of the issue of historic renovation or preservation. Um, I, I think it's far more important to preserve the ongoing changing history of a place. And what we discovered was that uh, when we started to work around the bridge, they unearthed a stone which described the history of this bridge over 300 years. It's been adapted, it's been transformed. Ours was simply the latest. Um, you'll see later that we not only fixed the arch, we, we basically uh, redid the surface of the bridge. Trying to understand the, that the reason the bridge had become dilapidated was because they had built a highway um, nearby, a, a bridge and a highway, and then this place, which used to be the site of the, the market and the connection between two ancient villages, the market basically moved to the highway itself. So uh, we wanted to find a way to um, make the bridge uh, literally a park, a kind of public space. We developed pavers uh, using PVC pipes, a triangular form, because it could adapt to different sizes. And students, uh, over a two-week period with villagers, paved um, this brick with these custom-designed pavers. So it functions as planting. Um, the positive elements function as seating. Also, if you're driving your motorcycle around and you've had a little bit too much to drink, you're less likely to fall off the bridge. Um, <coughs> and it, it, in one of these twists, um, as we were building it, they had, uh, somebody had donated and built a middle school nearby. So it suddenly became the favorite place of uh, school children who would um, pass through this bridge now to get to their um, uh, school. You can see the beginning of the wall there on the other side. Um, architecture's ability to um, adapt and to transform. This is uh, the last project I want to show you. Oh, no, 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 not, not the last. There is another one. I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't get too excited. Um, <clears throat> this project is being led primarily um, through my partner. Um, this is a project in which we did the, a lot of urban uh, research into Mongolia. And what you see here is the kind of Ger district. It's, uh, what has happened is that there has been a lot of uh, very cold winters recently. And so if you're Mongolian, then what you can do is you can come to the city and you can claim 700 square meters of land. And all you have to do is build a fence around it, go to the government office, and register your piece of land. Um, if only things were this simple in Thailand. But they have a lot of land there. So you can imagine that what has happened is a kind of massive influx of nomads from the, 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 the rural landscape coming and building these uh, these, these gear, gear districts. One of the problems is that there is absolutely no infrastructure. There's no infrastructure for water, for waste. Um, and then when they uh, live very close together, they're burning coal. So it becomes mass highly polluted. This is a, a kind of water kiosk in the city in which uh, they can come and they can get water. So what you see is this kind of two types of development and then this informal settlement. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Yeah, so this is basically the, uh, the, the current state of the, the waste collection system. Uh, one of the big problems is that when you're a nomad, you don't generate any waste at all. And when you come to the city, you start to buy bottles of water, you know, there's all sorts of stuff and you generate tons and tons of waste. It becomes a huge problem. So we worked with the city to develop a completely new program for these GER districts, uh, which would combine community center, um, showers, and a water kiosk with a place to um, deposit your waste. The idea is that these areas um, slowly develop with shops um, can come in as well in, in the summer become a little bit more of a center of this kind of, um, now, these big suburbs. Um, 
it's a very strange situation because uh, it, it's, I, I describe it as suburban because a, for the, the, well, those who have moved to the city many years ago, they have very nice houses. But because when they came, the first thing that you have to build is a fence. Fences are just, they're not common in uh, Mongolia. Uh, you, you know that uh, in Mongolian, there's no word for community, such as the kind of deeply ingrained nomadic culture. So they build the fence with whatever they can find. And it's only because the government needs it in order to um, distinguish the property lines. So they look like slums, but they're actually suburbs. Um, <clears throat> well, with no, uh, no water or... Uh, <laughs> Um, waste facilities. This is one of them. Uh, this will be tiled uh, with this kind of reflective tile being trying to work with the land and also introduce these things into the landscape in a very, very subtle um, way. It's so cold that they have to um, set fire, uh, fires in order to thaw the ground. Okay. So it's working very well. Now they throw the garbage directly on the ramp itself. Um, <clears throat> yet, basically discovering an entirely new need um, as opposed to adapting existing um, architecture. We're working at both extremes of this um, scenario. Okay, I want to show you the last pair, small projects versus large projects. Um, but it's, a, it's kind of a joke because we've we don't do any large projects. So I'm going to show you instead three small projects. Um, this is not done under Rural Urban Framework with my partner. It's a teaching collaboration with uh, a friend and colleague of mine, Olivia Altever. And it's three projects in wood, experimental constructions. Um, showing, I think, the, the, the power of the, the, the small. Um, maybe it's just because we had more freedom here. Uh, a, a library with a surface above um, and a connection down to the street below. And it exists in Yunnan province in a very, very steep and dramatic valley. It takes, um, when we mean small projects, it also means small funding. We were able to apply for a tiny amount of money. So when you have small funding, then you use whatever you can um, get your hands on. And in this case was this retaining wall, which helped us um, build an enclosed space with very, very little material. Um, <clears throat> we also built it in two phases. So the, the, the second phase involved these bookshelves, which would extend downward from the trusses. And the first phase was a, a connection, a covered space, connecting from the road above to the plaza. When we came to this village, often, um, Again, the work has the, the sort of innovation is simply to um, find a new program, find a new um, site. They wanted to do a library for this. Uh, it's an earthquake zone in which the government had rebuilt the, uh, the houses. They ha also built this big, big empty plaza. Um, you see it here on the left. And instead of uh, a site for the library, which would have been more or less a three-story generic house. Um, we convinced them to look into this site of this retaining wall and how the library might be able to activate this big empty sort of government plaza. So it's a project that um, sort of links downward and also rises up into this peak. Um, it's a single surface, the project. It's at the scale of Furniture, it's at the scale of landscape, it's at the scale of um, architecture building. We're trying to combine all these things into one very, very small structure. So it's, it's uh, simply a bookcase as well. I'm going to skip through the history of it, but there was also reasons why we wanted to build with wood because uh, the old houses all had these timber roofs which were abandoned for this brick and we wanted to sort of suggest that a timber could still be an important material, especially in building earthquake-resistant structures. So you see here the plaza, the side of the house, um, living in tents, and then the, the, the houses, um, new houses being built. 
part of it was part of the challenge was also to translate uh, a complex digital model um, into uh, techniques that were simple enough for you know local carpenters to build. They basically drew and assembled these trusses right on the the um, the playground. Everything was pre-cut in a factory and assembled using the most simple techniques. So I'm going to show you the different sections. There's 17 trusses which make up the structure. This is uh, the first truss. It's a simple doorway. And all the, um, all the material is also one single section of 3.3 3 mm by 11 um, millimeters. 11 cm, sorry. And it, it ends up as this kind of six meter high um, uh, uh, roof, pitch roof space. This is viewing upward in the digital model. So the trusses, they, they also start to create a kind of interesting space. Um, there, is, there is a reflective aluminum panel that um, was basically the cheapest way to waterproof this. And it, it's quite beautiful. It reflects downward. So you get the trusses and then this kind of reflective surface. Um, we did a second project, which involved um, a whole class of 70 students. I, at this time, I took over the uh, first year program at the university. And we began to involve the students in the construction. Whereas the first project was a series of uh, linear trusses, the second one involves trusses that um, work in a ten that connect tangentially in a circle. So once they're connected, it becomes a very strong ring. The, the first one was inside of this cliff. The second one was on top. These are the trusses. They all touch at one, just one point. And it's, it's again a viewing deck, but it's also a place um, next to the uh, primary school because now the kids are living there Monday to Friday and then the parents come and pick them up um, on the, the weekends. So it's a staging area in which um, parents can pick up their kids, working on site with students solving a lot of problems, solving um, geometric problems. A lot of design work actually happens on site. I'm going to quickly go through the rest of my slides and then maybe we can get into the discussion and then there are, you know, there's time to go back or discuss more. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Our nickname for it is the El Sombrero. Uh, And uh, last month, we just finished the third project. So now we're doing one of these every year in Yunnan. Um, it gets easier and easier uh, because we've developed techniques with a, a timber workshop. It's a lot about also um, a long process of uh, development in terms of um, construction, construction, construction methods. This is uh, recently the site is a, a recent earthquake in Zaltong, also in Yunnan, from last year. The, this is along a, a, a road um, that comes into town. And uh, at the time that we we're building this, they were also uh, repairing the road. A lot of people travel along this road. Um, school kids walk along the road. And eventually, the, the place will be uh, somewhere where on the steps people can sell their um, food, fruit, vegetables. It's a kind of marketplace. <clears throat> it has this quite amazing view. You see it here. And then underneath is a kind of shaded or sheltered area. Uh, you can rest. This is the, the space under the, um, the trusses. Also, you know, the things are going in parallel where we're responding to very, very um, site-specific challenges and developing programs in re relation to the community. But we also have our own set of agendas, so uh, the, our own set of explorations. We wanted to try to push this idea of the, the trusses, and this one is arranged um, longitudinally. So one is, is this way, the other is, uh, second is in a ring, and the third is um, along a line. The, the idea that architecture 
um, as a basis for experimentation is a very kind of strong um, belief of ours. And then the second, of course, is that spatially it's creating very, very rich and diverse experiences in terms of um, scale, um, <coughs> views. But yeah, it's a very simple project as well. Um, you know, since we're among architects here, I can tell you that um, for me, the origins of the project is this beautiful diagram by Le Corbusier of the, the, the day and night in which he draws a kind of simple sine curve. And that's really what it is. It's a, it's a single line that evolves into this um, sine curve. So the, the, the positive part uh, creates a space underneath, and then the, the valley also creates a space for sitting um, and viewing the landscape. <coughs> yeah, there you see it quite clearly. Over here. OK. Um, just very quickly, uh, the how long have I talked for? It's like nearly four hours. <laughs> huh? How long has it been? It's about. No, I, I'm. I'm not worried. I'm. I'm not worried about you. I'm worried about me. Um, <clears throat> what I'm doing right now in terms of teaching is, um, I believe very much in the the idea of the collective and uh, I'm working on a series of small workshops that explore different uh, village conditions and bring the condition back into the studio as a site. Uh, the first one was a workshop in Taiwan based on the urban village on these kind of uh, six-story walk-up buildings in which a lot of illegal construction has been built. They exist within every single um, urban block, this kind of neighborhood embedded within the city. Um, and so students, uh, this is the space. We put the plan of this on the ground. They documented uh, unique moments of illegal activities in which um, you know, two blocks are linked together or uh, one roof is connected to the ground floor of another building um, through a stairway and developed a series of rules, new urban rules based on these kind of illegal structures and tried to f find new prototypes for these types of blocks seeing them as a kind of um, new type of uh, walk-up uh, block, a, a new code for the city. Uh, then they drew the plans next to it. We built them quite large. This is about uh, like six days um, workshop, actually. Uh, I've also begun the, a new year one program. I've almost exclusively taught in the year one. Um, I teach these to students and also uh, the, the fourth year. Um, housing studio this semester, but my, my heart is in the, year, the first year program. Uh, Hong Kong University just recently transformed from a three-year undergraduate to a four-year undergraduate. So instead of adding a year above, we actually inserted a year underneath, and that's what you see here. It's an introduction to architecture. It's not about design. Um, it's about uh, three collective sites, 70 students divided into three. The first is um, inspired by the kind of Miao villages, which we went to visit um, <clears throat> in, our, in our design build project. Students literally carved blocks of uh, plaster to make a, a landscape. And then they had to solve the problem of a house using um, a single wood elements that had to support uh, two plaster bricks. So each is about solve, um, working with a different kind of um, originating problem. Uh, this one deals with structure. You'll see the next one deals with program, and the third one deals with um, space, saying that architecture uh, needs all three, but you could begin anywhere. The second village um, is inspired by looking at these kind of generic villages with a kind of generic concrete frame. So what the students did was they built the... Um, the, the frame, and then had to try and adapt the program of the house uh, within this frame. It's three generations. It's, uh, the program is actually taken from the, the village which you saw earlier. And the third is a traditional village that is undergoing um, development and expansion. So everybody has, every student has a unique site. 
and they have to develop uh, a massing model which allows them to expand the house, um, double the volume, but begin to still relate it uh, to the kind of public space, to the, the, the roof line, etc. Okay, I want to end with um, these series of slides, which is a visit to the Tulos. I know I've said I'm going to end like five times now. So kind of a little trick I have, psychological trick. Uh, <clears throat> I have an eight-year-old, and this tends to work uh, when I'm dealing with him. Um, I was amazed by the Tulos because there's simply hundreds of them, and they're all different. The abandonment of the, the, the development of this kind of uh, generic construction technique, you know, dating back to um, Corbu, is, is overwhelming. And not only are they simply replacing these two lows, this is the new two low, actually. An entire community, the same size of this, will live vertically now with each family stacked above. You know, surprisingly, I don't know if you know this, but the two lows, each family lives in a vertical section. So they have a three-story building. It's a kind of hyper-urban model. And the kitchen's below. Um, this is a picture from one of the two lows where the central courtyard, which is uh, the, the basis of, of shared life for um, uh, produce, drying, animals. Now, every villager wants to have a bathroom and, uh, you know, a kitchen, a modern kitchen. So what they've done is they divided the circle into these pie shapes, and everybody has then their toilet and their um, water tower. It's the, 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 I think, the attack of the, the, you know, the, the community from the, the individual. It's how, of course, has a lot to do with the economy. We can talk all about all that. Sometimes they're even plugging in their own private houses on the outside of the Tulo as a way to expand this. It's actually pretty interesting. Um, but it, it's, I want to show you this because I think it describes how I see myself, my role as an architect, which is to come back into this, um, this, this gap, this expansion from the sl slow and long vernacular development of architecture without architects into a sudden jump in which um, generic construction techniques, contractors have taken over, and fill it with new ideas that try to tie between these two extremes. So to work as an architect, not in the new, but within the evolution of, you know, to come back into what would have been a kind of evolutionary process, um, and to work within this gap. Uh, thank you. And thank you very much, John Lin, for such a wonderful lecture you share with us. Um, now, please welcome Ajahn Pilada Tawi Brangsi Porn, the moderator for this session. Wow. <laughs> wow, indeed. Um, well, wow. first of all, uh, thank you for such an inspiring and um, what shall I say, um, horizon broadening, perhaps, um, and, and very kind of very exciting and powerful messages that you have brought us today. I mean, I'm still got like mind blown from, from all the range of the things that you have done. And um, I mean, um, we, were, we were talking earlier about um, my first impression of, of just looking through the range of your works and it seems um